This week's episode is brought to you by The Communist Store. That's right, get all your favorite Communicore Weekly t-shirts and music at CommunicoreWeekly.com. Click on the store link and you can find all that cool swag that you want to get. Or just go to Communicore Weekly, that's Spreadshirt.com, and buy your favorite shirt. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And due to some crazy time travel technology, it's now after Dragon Con, but also before Dragon Con at the same time. So I'm I'm tired and I'm excited at the same time. Do you want, does that make sense to you? Did we did we have a good time? We had a good time? Okay, and like like a thousand people came to see us at our live show? One thousand people saw us at our live show? See, I'm responding, just kind of making it a question, but not really, so it could be so, true either way. Yeah, nobody really knows what we're talking about. True, that's very true. Well, if you did come uh, to the Communicore Weekly live show at DragonCon, thank you very much for, for coming. And mm-hmm. if you enjoyed it, we've been Communicore Weekly. And if you didn't like it, we've been... Um, you know, don't know what I'm going to say to that. Never mind. We should probably just go into the history segment. It's time for Disney History! You guys already know that Pirates of the Caribbean is one of, if not the most popular attraction at Disney theme parks worldwide. You know, and they got different versions all over the world, and it's kind of a gigantic movie franchise that had, you know, spawned from it, and pretty much attraction is going to live forever in the hearts and minds of Disney fans. But that said, long before they invaded the Caribbean, Disney had a very long history with pirates in general. So long before Captain Jack swaggered across our screens, the very first encounter Disney had with pirates was with Mickey Mouse himself. In the 1934 cartoon Shanghai, Mickey saves Minnie from pirate Pegleg Pete and his crew. Disney didn't cross paths with pirates uh, again until years later in 1950 when Disney's first live action film, Treasure Island, came out. Now, Treasure Island was adapted from the novel by Robert Louis Stevenson, and Disney's version introduced audiences to one of the most unforgettable pirate performances of all time. One that would pretty much become the standard for all other pirates that, you know, for them to be measured against. So, the story is about Jim Hawkins, played by Disney child actor uh, Bobby Driscoll, who comes into possession of a treasure map. And he boards a ship to search for the treasure, and it's there that he meets Long John Silver, played by Robert Newton. I like their fish and chips. Yes, um, me too. So, yeah, Silver tries to start a mutiny to take over the ship and take the treasure for himself. However, it fails. So instead, he kidnaps Jim to an island where a battle ensues for the treasure. It really is a great pirate story and still holds up well today. However, uh, just as interesting as the story was the production of the film. Yeah, so Walt and RKO Pictures was actually uh, kidnapped by... No, that's not what happened. Um, (laughs) Walt and RKO Pictures, the the distribution company, they had a lot of money that was frozen in in England. And I'm not talking like in a freezer. Like, it was frozen in the way that it couldn't be used anywhere else except within the country. So they decided to make a film there. So they hired the uh, veteran pirate cinematographer Byron Haskin to direct, since he had plenty of experience uh, with pirate films. Um, However, it was Robert Newton who was the last piece of this amazing pirate puzzle. Newton really brought Long John Silver to life and was the Captain Jack Sparrow of his day. His gravelly voice and recurrent args are the model for pretty much every other pirate performance and joke that has come since. He was so good at it that he repeated the role for a TV show and a non-Disney theatrical sequel. Unfortunately, the film didn't do well during its uh, first theatrical run, and it wasn't really until years later that it received the praise that it does today. And it's now known as uh, one of Disney's most popular live-action films, and it actually even had a tie-in uh, to Walt Disney World, with Treasure Island being, name, being the name of the island in Bay Lake that guests could visit and relives par- relive part of the films, um, kind of. But that was changed to Discovery Island shortly after that and became a wildlife preserve. 
So three years after Treasure Island, Disney waded back into the waters with Peter Pan in 1953. The film featured one of Disney legend's greatest villains, Captain Hook. The film once again featured Bobby Driscoll as the voice of the boy who never grew up, but it was really Hook who stole the show. Now, Hook was brought to life by animator Frank Thomas and voiced by Hans Conried, um, and he kind of came to represent all things piratey. And though he's often played for laughs, he definitely has a treacherous and a devious overtone to him. I mean, he wants to kill basically what amounts to a young boy. That sounds pretty evil to us. <laughs> yes, yeah, so in addition to Hook and his pirate crew, his right-hand man is Mr. Schmee, the bumbling foil. Uh, animated by Ollie Johnston and voiced by by Bill Thompson, he's the now stereotypical version of a dumb pirate. Rumor has it that Hook and Shmi were actually caricatures of their animators, and if you look closely, you can definitely see it. Now, Disney, Disney pirates, they didn't just live out on the open ocean. They often invaded the Wild West as well. I know that sounds kind of strange, but there was such a thing as river pirates. More specifically, in 1956, during the height of Crockett Mania, Walt decided to repackage some of the Disneyland TV episodes as feature films. And so, the silver screen got Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. The story was a prequel to the other Crockett tales and had Davy, played by Fess Parker, and his friend George Russell, played by Buddy Epson, challenged by the River Pirates, led by Mike Fink, who was played by Jeff York. The Pirates challenged our heroes to a keelboat race to New Orleans. Of course, they had a lot of Wild West tropes to them and weren't typical pirates, but they were pirates nonetheless. In 1960, Disney returned to Robert Louis Stevenson's world with their adaptation of Kidnapped. Now, the film starred James MacArthur as David Bal Balfour, uh, sorry, Balfour, who was double-crossed by his uncle while trying to reclaim his inheritance, and finds himself kidnapped, hence the name, by a pirate crew. The film was unfairly compared to Treasure Island in many ways, and thus didn't enjoy much success. In fact, while people were hating on Kidnapped, that was when their love of Treasure mm -hmm. Island started. Go figure. Also in the press release, Disney stated that the film's director, Robert Stevenson, was a distant relative of author Robert Louis Stevenson. However, later, the director debunked this as a uh, marketing ploy. That's actually kind of clever, though. You gotta give Disney props for that I mean, one. You're, you're distantly related to other Heimbucks, right? Yeah, very, very yeah. distantly related to other Heimbucks. There you go. Like my brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so following in more pirate footsteps, later in 1960, Disney released The Swiss Family Robinson, about a family who are stranded on a remote island and create many of the comforts of home on it. And the finale of the film is known for when the Robinsons protect their home from a shipload, and yes, we said shipload, of bloodthirsty pirates. I just want to clarify for the kids. Yes, you gotta be careful. So in 1968, the live-action comedy Blackbeard's Ghost appeared on the scene. Also directed by Robert Stevenson, no relation, Dean Jones played a track coach in a small seaside town who uncovers the curse of Blackbeard the Pirate, played for laughs by Peter Ustinov. So after he unleashes the ghost, uh, the coach is the only one who can actually see him. And this film is pretty much an underrated gem in my opinion, and one of the last live action films that had Walt, Disney, Walt Disney's hands all over it. Um, you know, it had great special effects and some really great slapstick comedy as well. And if you look closely, you can even see Dean Jones trying not to laugh when Blackbeard is doing his thing. That's how funny Blackbeard was. <laughs> yes, uh, 19 years passed before Disney returned to the world of pirates. In 1996, Muppets Treasure Island came out as a hilarious adaptation of the book and Disney's original film. Uh, Tim Curry took over the role of Long John Silver and was fantastic in that role. That was actually my first experience with Treasure Island, and oh. honestly, I think it's my still my favorite. I mean, Benjamina Pig? Come on, you can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, getting a little futuristic, uh, Treasure Planet came out in 2002, uh, which was an adventure tale that was set in outer space as opposed to the high seas. And again, this is another underappreciated gem in my opinion, and even nods to uh, a certain Disney attraction with Ben, the android, a uh, hums of pirate's life for me during one portion of the film. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, everything changed in 2003 when Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, arrived in the theaters. Produced by Jerry Bruckheimer and directed by Gore Verbinski, this film took the world by storm, successfully adapting the beloved ride into a fantastic film. Uh, Captain Jack Sparrow 
became a pirate that everyone knew and loved. And of course, the film has three sequels. There's another one on the way. Um, you pretty much can't go into Pirates of the Caribbean now without seeing a portion <laughs> of the film in it. I mean, it's everywhere. Johnny Depp and Jeffrey Rose were both added to the ride due to the film's popularity. Yeah, and so pirates have been around Disney for many, many years and have a very rich history with the company. You know, I'm sure we'll continue to see them well into the future, but whether or not the star Johnny Depp remains to be seen. So we would love to know what you guys think about all the piratey goodness that we've just talked about, whether it's some of the animation, some of the live action films, or of course, Pirates of the Caribbean itself. Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. It's George's Book of the Week. Okay, so we both, meaning Jeff and I, both of us received copies of Troll Hunters. Troll Hunters. I'm going to say it like that every time you mention it. <laughs> I like it. Definitely. It's the new book by Guillermo del Toro and Daniel Cross. Um, and everyone should know by this point in time that I'm not a big fan of horror movies or books. Or the dark. Or, or the dark, yeah. Anything scary, <laughs> really. Um, but since this was released by Disney, it's a Disney title, and Del Toro has been in talks to make a movie or two for Disney, I thought, ah, I should suck this one up, take one for the team, and read it. I mean, to be fair, I had to convince George, uh, because it is <laughs> aimed at kids, so that may have been what convinced him. Um, I figured he'd be okay. But, I mean, really, I love Del Toro's work, so I was intrigued what a young adult uh, book by him would be like. So, for those of you who are fans of his work, let me put it this way. If you crossed Hellboy with Pan's Labyrinth, but aimed it towards a younger audience, you'd basically get Troll Hunters, and, I mean, it's really amazing. I think it's a great book. Is that from... Uh... Supernatural, the ghost I, killers. Actually, yeah, actually, I think it is. That's okay, good. That's that's from. Anyway, okay, we're mixing our genre as well. Uh, I, I, hopefully, we won't talk about any spoilers in the review because you know most of the time we don't. But I am really glad I read the book, and I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, book, as we mentioned, is geared towards tweens and young teens. But I think most people are going to enjoy the book, especially if they like Del Toro or they want to try something new. Um, this uh, book feels like it's leading into a larger series, like Harry Potter. Um, doesn't have the same feel as Harry Potter, but you can see the characters are coming along and there's some challenges. Yeah. But uh, Del Toro uh, and uh, Krauss, they were able to create a very believable world with characters that you really care for and, and characters that you want to see succeed. And, and I didn't get scared that much. <laughs> I have to admit that the book was not what I was expecting, but I was absolutely pleasantly surprised by it. Um, and it definitely felt like it was leading to something else, like for another go round in the future. But the story itself, you know, in the book is to me, it felt like quite compact, and it even turned a lot of the tropes of what you're used to for horror and like even troll related stuff on its head. And on top of that, there was a lot of humor in the book because I seriously laughed out loud. You know, a number of times, more times than I thought I was going to. Yeah, there was a lot of humor. So the story itself centers around a, a modern teenage boy named Jim Sturgis, who isn't leading the most popular life in school. Uh, his father is a loner that has more security systems than Fort Knox. And then when you understand what happened to Jim's father when he was a preteen, then you understand why he is so focused on security. Uh, we also run into Jim's friend, Tubbs, and the girl that Jim is carrying a torch for. We'll just call her Claire, because that's her name in the book. <laughs> and because uh, uh, I'm sort of a sucker for teen romances. I know, don't ask me. But, you know, I, I didn't get scared that much. You guys notice the theme here? George wasn't scared that much, <laughs> and it is a miracle. Um, but seriously, overall, the story... You know, they really has characters that come to life. They're fully realized, they're fleshed out people, or trolls in some cases, and they jump off the page, not literally, because George would not read the book then. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> there were definitely plenty of times that I was reading it, and I was like, oh, this is definitely a Del Toro thing. Um, it was kind of like watching one of his films at, at times, but for kids. 
And Del Toro and, and Kraus really worked well together to craft this excellent story, and George wasn't scared that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Del Toro you know, really did, or does, an excellent job with the dialogue uh, and the action scenes. The battles feel really believable, and you can, you can sort of see yourself as part of the action. Uh, the characters in the story go beyond the usual one dimension that you see in most children's literature. Uh, and although we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of attention paid to children's lit over the past years, um, and it's become more sophisticated overall, it's still nice to see an author treat his universe like it's real and constantly changing. And it's, it's obviously at this point that we both really like the book and that I didn't get scared that much. Uh, oh, okay. What did scare you about the book? Because now I need to know. <laughs> okay. The one thing I thought was pretty scary were the really incredible illustrations by Sean Murray. Uh, there were maybe five or six scattered throughout the book. And there's one of the troll lord, and he was really frightening. I didn't like that. Um, and there was also some scenes, scenes with Stephen who was the school athletic star and a bully who turned out to be more frightening and meaner than the scenes with any of the trolls, you know, especially the ones that come out from under your bed. Oh, crap. You got to go to bed soon. So you better yeah, be I know your, it's later your, here. Great. But I'm going to have to read something funny now as a palate cleanser. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. But you're right. That guy was creepy as heck, so I can't blame you. Um, regardless, <laughs> troll hunters, troll hunters. It was great. I loved it. Um, I think kids and parents that are fans of Del Toro will definitely get a kick out of the book uh, and not have to sleep with the lights on like George. It's just a nightlight or a couple or several. Troll or Hunters. Okay, yeah, so this week's book was... <clears throat> Troll Hunters. Thank you. By Guillermo, <laughs> Guillermo Del Toro, always going to kill me now, and Daniel Cross. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window. This week's window is located in Hong Kong Disneyland, and it reads, Grand Central Real Estate Company, Houses Bought and Sold. Now, the Grand Central Air Terminal was originally an airport in Glendale, California, that was used until 1959. Uh, the Walt Disney Company bought it in 1997, and is the current home of Walt Disney Imagineering. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. This week's goat actually comes to us from Cadet Bob G, who recently went on a Disney cruise without us, unfortunately. Oh, I know, I know. Anyway, the cruise took him to the magical land of Castaway Key, where he found this goat hiding on the main walkway from the ship to the island trams. And it's on the fence uh, at Marge's Barges and Sea Charters. Now, there's a sign with a boat on it that reads, Dock Captain Bob Iger Shrimp Distributions. Quality reliability, Key West, Willow Bay. Of course, Bob Iger is the current CEO of the Walt Disney Company, and it makes me wonder if he also owns stock in the Bubba Gum Shrimp Company, because that makes it sense makes to me. It makes me wonder if he's actually ever seen that, or this is the first time he's heard it is on our show. Maybe, possibly. Could be. Well, Bob, if you know about that sign, if you have a duplicate hanging in your house, we want to know about it. Yeah, we want to see a picture of that, too. Invite us over. Yeah, For wow. drinks. <laughs> Okay, I'm done. Or or anything? Or any just to hang out and say hey, just to no hang big out, deal. Chill, watch some TV. We'll even watch Descendants with you. Yeah, that's fine. I know George doesn't like it, but I like it. Anyway, getting off subject again. <laughs> it's yes, that time true. again to announce the winner from this week's Year of a Million or So Limited Time Cadets. Um, this week we're gonna give away a copy of the Disneyland Book of List by Chris Strada. We we reviewed it um, a couple of weeks it. ago on the show. Yeah, right? yeah, we loved it. It loved was great. It. I loved it. Um, so much but fun. the cadet who's going to get this prize is Daryl T. from Columbiaville, Michigan. Congratulations, Daryl. Um, and again, if you want to get in on the action and possibly win a prize, be sure to send us an email at communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name, your address, and your birthday so we can get you on the prize list. And who knows, you may hear yourself winning a prize at the end of an episode sometime. We can hope so. We, we can, can hope, hope so. so. Ah, and speaking of hope, we hope you stay to the end of the episode. Maybe? I'm very confused by this one, but okay. I know. I'm going to roll with it. 
Yeah, we'll go. So thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yes, yeah, so if you enjoyed the show, leave us a rating on iTunes or a comment on YouTube. However you listen to or absorb the show, let us know. We want to hear from you. Yes, we need more nine stars. Um, you can always email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com just to say about anything you want to. We're okay with that. Pretty much. much. Pretty much. Really are. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicoreweekly. And follow us on all the social medias. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm at Imagine Earning, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, give a, give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. And we just want to remind everybody to visit the Communa Store at CommunicoreWeekly.com, where you can get your very own copy of Communicore Weekly, the musical. It's 45 minutes of awesomeness, and we should know because we were there. That's true. We were there in an yeah. alternate timeline. Ooh. Um, you can also send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856, and I'll send you back a an official cadet membership card and also a Communicore Weekly sticker. How cool is that? It's pretty cool, actually. That's awesome. It is. So, okay. Cool. And you can always visit patreon.com slash weekly and find out how you can help support the greatest online show. So for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Tying shoes. <laughs>